Welcome to the Bob Wellness HealthCast, episode number 313, The Medical Evolution of Vibrators. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. In the 1700s, throughout Europe and in particular in England, uh, women, many women were diagnosed with a medical condition called hysteria. And some of them were institutionalized in mental hospitals. Uh, and a standard treatment, a, a medical treatment for hysteria, which is not precisely defined, but generally manifested as a breakdown of, of self-control uh, caused by stress or a chemical imbalance or whatever it might. We don't know what was causing it. They, we just have the records of. They were just unmanageable women. Was, they, they <laughs> or were screaming, yelling, thrashing around. Uh, crying, being frightened, uh, being visibly agitated, or in just some depressed, way. Uh, or not so much that. I mean, that's a, a concern and a condition, mm-hmm. but not for this particular treatment. Okay. I don't think. Uh, so there was a medical treatment for hysteria that became commonly used. That was uh, designed to induce what was called at that time uh, hysterical paroxysm. Uh, Today, we call that medical treatment masturbation, and we call hysterical paroxysm orgasm. The physicians of the day would regularly physically manipulate females in a hysterical breakdown by masturbating them for whatever duration it took to get them to a state where the tensions and panic and distress that they were experiencing would resolve, and they would quiet. And then if that reoccurred, they would do it again. If it reoccurred, they would do it again. Uh, It was not considered to be a sexual behavior. It was not sexualized in its discussion in the medical literature. Doctors didn't perceive that they were doing anything sexual. It truly was considered to be a medical uh, treatment. But doctors complained that they were having to do so much of it that they were getting cramps and exhaustion in their hands and not able to do the other things they needed to do. So a physician invented one, uh, a device uh, called a manipulator. Uh, I believe it's, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, yes. Called a manipulator. And it was a steam-powered vibrator. And so and that was in the 1800s. That was in that was actually a physician named George Taylor. It was 1869. So just in case you thought these were recent phenomena, yeah, yeah. This this is a this is our great 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 grandmothers and grandfathers. But only the ones that were hospitalized for hysteria. Well, and not even hospitalized. It was yeah. outpatient. If you watch, if you watch Hysteria, which is uh, the, a hilarious movie, especially for a gynecologist, yeah. it's set in the late 1800s right. and. Women who were, who who had the means yeah. and, would and the reputation. And the, Their husbands would bring them to yeah. the doctor. She's out of control. She's hysterical. But they didn't have to act hysterical when they went in. They were just going in for their weekly or treatment. bi-weekly or twice a week treatment, and they would go in and they were placed in lithotomy, the position that you place women in to do a pap smear or to deliver a baby. Lithotomy. Lithotomy. Okay. And so it's like in stirrups. Okay. And they, I mean, describing this is kind of important just so that you understand what the situation was, was and how they made it medical and a medical treatment. And then they put like a A drape, a drape, but more of a a, a wire, a wire um, frame so that the drape went all over so they could barely see the doctor. Right. And the doctor then proceeded to wash his hands, lubricate his hands, and then use his hands to bring the woman to orgasm, and then they would then feel better. They didn't have to be crazy. Mm -hmm. All they had to be was, oh, I don't feel so well Mm -hmm. in this movie. But I I assume that this ended up being less of an emergency treatment and more of an outpatient kind of maintenance treatment Mm -hmm. to keep women happy in the Victorian era when 
sex was considered only for con conception. It was not considered something that a man and woman do all the time throughout their marriages. It was considered. Well, we still struggle with that in our culture today. The, the balance yeah, we're kind line of Victorian between still. sex as a pleasurable or physiologically necessary behavior mm -hmm. or sexual release, release uh, and sex as an avenue for procreation. Right. So wherever you go in the United States, at least, you can get a heated discussion on that topic. You know, why do we have sex? Why do we have sexual urges? Uh, the urges, some people believe that the urges um, impel us to sexual behavior so that we can procreate, and that's the only legitimate function for sexual outlet or release. Others say it's a physiological condition of need that we have to find a way to satisfy, and however we can do that within the bounds of propriety and legality and safety, you know, like not having sex with children or not assaulting God, someone, I hope. not violating someone, right. you know, but within that range, then there are debates about, well, what's appropriate, what's legitimate, what, how, how do we resolve these physiological uh, impelled needs? And now, and now in, in most enlightened medical communities, we realize that sex is, first of all, a natural uh, a natural urge, and it is not bad, and that having sex is good for you, mm -hmm. and it releases a lot of neurotransmitters that make us feel the happy the and nor right. right. And, and instead of a drug, then we have the natural the natural act of having safe sex, mm -hmm. and and being fulfilled in that way, making us feel happier, healthier, and better. I mean, from a, a physician standpoint. That's how I, I view it as a physician. And, and, and patients who come in and, and talk to me about this very issue who are conflicted because they may have been told by their mother or grandmother that it was a sin to masturbate, right. yet their husband has just passed away and they had a very active sex life and they do not want to go out into finding another partner just for that. They ask me for advice mm -hmm. about how to obtain... Relief. Relief and how to get a vibrator without their neighbors knowing and without being embarrassed and without having to go into a sex shop. Yeah. So so those are the questions that I get. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you that until about 15 years ago, I knew nothing about vibrators. It was never even mentioned. They don't teach it in medical school? They don't, te they don't teach it in medical school or, God forbid, in OBGYN where we are talking about sex all day long. Mm -hmm. That is our... That's how people get pregnant. That's how we get how people get sexually transmitted diseases. I mean, that's our thing. Right. But they never even gave us a course on yeah. sexuality. It was all about surgery, and I, I mean, it was all very just clinical, but not about people's lives. Right. So then you go out in the world, and they come in and they say, "So, I need to know about what kind of vibrator. Where do I get it? How?" Do I, I mean, on, and the first time somebody asked me this is probably twenty years ago, and I went. I'm going to have to get back to you. Mm -hmm. And I So had, then where, where did you go 20 years ago to get your information? <laughs> my much younger staff. Really? I went to my much younger staff when we were having a little intimate meeting. And I said, I need to be educated on this. Because mm -hmm. there was there's a break between now people who are 60-something mm -hmm. and people who are 50 and less are completely different. 60-somethings and above, or 50-somethings and above, are very inhibited about this. We're not taught. We didn't talk about it with our girlfriends. We didn't admit we would have owned something like this. And then Children the people... Like something secretive. Yeah, it was It was like, and, you know, you'd hide it and you don't want anyone so to know. So the girls talk about yes. it and share information yes, they do. about style and product. They do, and, and Cosmo has stuff in it and Glamour has stuff in it. I mean, oh, wow. you if you look at women's magazines... I, I don't. <laughs> ...that aren't... Yeah, I know. Sad to say. I I'm so glad. Yeah. Um, if you look at women's magazines, there's a lot of information to be had about these things, and it's considered in the generation that buys those magazines to be open and let's discuss this and let's get the m most information we can. So, I mean, maybe we've made a breakthrough, maybe not all over the United States, right, maybe right. just in a few areas, but I have to tell you that American College of OBGYN isn't helping us. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be the experts on sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not. So I had to learn from my staff, and then I researched it, and then I went to a, a conference, which mm -hmm. is how doctors learn things after residency. 
by Susan Berman. She's a psychologist who then educates doctors about sexuality. Mm -hmm. And her big thing is vibrators and self-stimulators and couple stimulators. And she, at these conferences, she brings them all out and you can go look at them and ask people how, how they're used and, and gather all this information. Mm -hmm. So you can take that information back to people who aren't comfortable with asking someone or talking about it. would never see it. themselves at a conference with a whole table full of vibrators to look at and touch. No, I mean, it was the best conference I've ever been to. It was really good and it was very interesting. There was no one out of their seat ever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is like everybody was absorbing all this information about sex from Susan Berman and her team. So it was it was an amazing, enlightening thing, and that was over ten years ago, yeah. maybe two thousand maybe two thousand and four, twelve years ago. So this is this is out there if you look for it in the medical community, and we need to mm -hmm. because we need to know how to talk to people when they ask us. What do I do? Well, and it's not sleazy. It's not sensual. It's not crude. It's not forbidden. It's not nasty. Uh, especially when approached from the perspective of being a physician who's trying to resolve questions and health issues for her patients who don't have the knowledge or the ability to put themselves in a situation to get that information. Elsewhere. That's why you go, you to, go to your doctor and ask physicians. This is so what we recommend for people for to expert do. information. Yeah. So, exactly. so oftentimes I will start using the word vibrator mm -hmm. to see if someone will actually well, if, up be able until to say the 1980s, it. 1980s, they were pretty much called personal massage uh, vibrators. Well, in public the they were, there but was, in private they were vibrators. Yes. Uh, actually, I remember. My parents in the in the 1950s had one of those uh, motors that strapped on your hand that had little <laughs> wire bands that went underneath your hand and plugged into a wall. It was called a Swedish massager, mm -hmm. and they, they were common. Uh, they would give me like a head massage or a neck massage, and they would laugh and they would say, "You know, this is for that." And my dad would say, "I have it because I have neck problems and what what have you." I now know better. Years later, the primary use of those things mm -hmm. was not for neck tension, except <laughs> in the most remote and indirect way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, so that was their way of complying with society, yes. not being, except, pers except in the couple, not being um, a weirdo. Yeah. Because that's what pe people were considered sex addicts or something if they had vibrators. So, so now... When patients have unequal sexual um, desires with their spouse, mm -hmm. they have to decide how to handle that. If a, if a man has more sex drive than a woman, mm -hmm. then um, often they bring people to me for testosterone. But, but even right. then, their appetites may not be equal. Right. The um, people marry each other, but they don't really go, oh, how's your sexual appetite? Or the, or huh, is cultural, mine the equal to it? Their cultural openness to certain behaviors may not mm -hmm. be equal, may not be balanced. Where mm -hmm. one person might be like, oh, I'm willing to explore this. I'm willing to try this. Let's see, have an adventure. The other one might be much more conservative, much more restrained. And so you get a state of imbalance or tension in a relationship. You also have people that have sexual abuse histories. You have mm -hmm. people that have physiological issues with orgasm. You know, we, we've done uh, health casts on uh, the different locator sites from which women can achieve an orgasm. Mm -hmm. And the fact that some women who've had a hysterectomy lose the ability to have an orgasm at the primary site or the at most the common cervix. site. At the cervix. Cervix or va they call them vaginal, vaginal orgasms. orgasms, but they're really cervical it's so cervix if moving. a woman is suffering from that and is not able to discuss that with her husband or a partner, and they are not able to go to a physician and say, can you recommend something that would help us? Then their relationship is in a state of, of tension that can lead to a breakup. And that's the kind of thing that you would yes. talk to patients Absolutely. about for 30 years. We and then I would be seeing the patient and say, now this is the G spot. Mm -hmm. Now here it is. Yeah. Here's where it is. This is the clitoris. This is where it is. This mm -hmm. is the sir. I mean, the education they didn't get in school. Right. But, but physical location is important in terms of women directing their partner to the right area. It's hard to talk to a man and say, well, the right area is, two centimeters up from the outside of the vagina on the top, you know, 
it's hard to describe, but if you show somebody their own area of stim that needs stimulation, yeah. then that's easier to learn. So I would be doing the physical part. You would be doing the emotional part. But what I, I wanted to say about the unequal sex drive was right. somebody has more sex drive and the other person isn't, it isn't willing to in, ramp it up or mm. doesn't want to mm. or dislikes it, then the person that has more sex drive can use something to decrease their anxiety and to uh, Take an edge orgasm. Off. Yeah. So, so that is one of the things that we can talk about and shouldn't be embarrassed about because no. that makes a um, that can make a marriage survive. Well, I'll give you an example from my practice. I had a couple that I saw where the man suffered from issues of premature ejaculation, mm -hmm. and the woman was complaining pretty consistently that she was left hanging, unsatisfied, mm -hmm. whenever they attempted to have sex. And then he was embarrassed, and she was frustrated and angry, and mm -hmm. there were issues that were about to shatter the marriage. And one of the things that we talked about was getting a vibrator and using it for foreplay. Mm -hmm. So it would speed up her side of the cycle mm -hmm. when they finally did get together mm -hmm. or using it for post play mm -hmm. whenever he had achieved what he had achieved, if, whether or not he would be willing to continue to participate mm -hmm. for her sake uh, through using one of these devices. And so they experimented with that, and they found that that helped them restore a balance and reduce a tension mm -hmm. in their relationship that was coming out of physiological, predominantly physiological issues that they didn't have an answer for. So, so that's and that's a, a a really great example. Another great example is I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> we do the same thing all the time. I'm bored, and the, and those couples they get into a routine. They like have Saturday an morning. They have, have a to, whole yeah. box of toys to juice it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's safer than like trying to find an elevator you can, or some weird place you can do it to yeah. juice it up. That's not oh. always safe. And so it, this is a safer way of kind of changing over when you've had years and years and years of being with the same person to make it more exciting, interesting for the adventurous couple. Well, and we were, we're calling this the medical evolution of vibrators. You know, you, the movie that you were talking about, Hysteria, was about a doctor who, who patented the first electrical vibrator uh, in 1880, Dr. Uh, Mortimer, uh, Joseph Mortimer Granville. And, and so, again, patented it as use as a medical device mm -hmm. for a personal... To save uh, those doctor's hands. Massager, save those doctor's <laughs> hands, exactly. And that continued to be the predominant approach until 1902 when the Hamilton Beach Company, <laughs> electronic company, uh, patented the first electric vibrator available for consumer retail use. So they're moving it out of the medical mm -hmm. arena, the totally or predominantly medical mm -hmm. arena, making it available, marketing it for consumer use. And it's interesting because they go on to say... Uh, making the vibrator the fifth domestic appliance to be electrified. After, after the <laughs> I, didn't, I read through that and didn't read that, but that is hilarious. After the sewing machine, the fan, the tea kettle, and the toaster. What happened to the refrigerator? Well, that came later. <laughs> the vacuum cleaner and the electric iron refrigerator all came later. But the fifth on the line of devices to be electrified for uh, uh, ease of, of use or access was a vibrator. That just but proves they, how important that but was. But they sold them uh, under the rubric of personal massagers, like the, I was saying mm -hmm. the example of the Swedish massage. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1920s, they kind of fell out of acceptability because they began to be used in the making of pornographic movies. Right, and that's where and it got its bad got name. people horrified and offended, and so they, they took them away, or they quit trying to sell them. And then in the 1960s, with the sexual revolution, they came back, and mm -hmm. they came back as personal massagers. Mm -hmm. Now it has evolved to the point where they call them vibrators. And mm -hmm. that's the most common name. Dildos mm -hmm. is probably the second mm -hmm. most common name. But they come mm -hmm. in all different kinds of sizes and shapes and functions. Uh, Multi-speed, rechargeable batteries, uh, cordless, uh, corded, it depends. I also even, didn't even think... Even waterproof and underwater usage. I didn't so, think that men would need this, but when I went to one of the sites just to do the research... Right. On this, mm -hmm. there are there are vagina substitutes, yes. and I mean so. Well, the, when we were doing hand, our research, we even found when hands aren't enough for transgender transgendering males that 
helps them transition in the way that they experience sexual uh, release. So there are medical reasons, there are personal reasons, there are cultural reasons to consider this as a possibility uh, for someone that you care about. Uh, the cultural acceptance is evolving. It's becoming more mainstream, less shame-based. The whole concept of masturbation is evolving to be less shame-based, not medically challenged, so it won't make you go blind, it won't cause you know, some horrific thing. Uh, some religious perception is evolving to more liberality with regard to these sexual behaviors within a context of a family and a committed relationship. You know, they, they put qualifiers on it, but, they, but it has evolved. I mean, I, I, I've been doing counseling for 30 years with couples and 30 plus years, and the conversations that we have had over the years have evolved somewhat uh, more liberally away from the concept that it's a sin and it's forbidden to the concept that there might be a positive contribution that this can make to my life and my relationship. So I'm open to considering. As a matter of fact, my understanding is there's only one state in the union that still doesn't allow the open sale of personal massagers or vibrators. Uh, and that's the state of Alabama, but you can still get one in Alabama if you have a <clears throat> doctor's note, if you have a prescription for one, mm -hmm. but just the average person mm -hmm. walking into a store uh, can't get one. But every other state now, they're, they're sold at Target, at Walmart, at Walgreens, at Kroger, at Safeway. You know. they, they even have, they, you know, we haven't brought them into our office, although we've been, we've discussed been that yeah. and we've been asked to. Um, but having said that, there are so many different types. I'm not sure that we could actually keep up with uh, demand change, yeah. and they constantly change. However, um, even in St. Louis, Missouri, right. I was worried about what some of my patients, my age and older, and some a few years younger might think Yeah, and the bad connotation they might have. But, but when I have, you know, it's so ridiculous to think that way Yeah. because when I look at ultrasounds of babies in utero, they masturbate, right. both boys and girls, in utero. So mm, I don't think it means that we are, that we're perverse. I think it means that that's a natural function to calm, calm people down and that if babies do it in utero before they're even born, then it's kind of a normal it's a normal thing. I'm smiling because I've raised two sons. And <laughs> as young boys, I can tell you, preschool infants, uh, they massage themselves constantly. I mean, you see little boys all the time with one hand down the front yeah, of their, in their diaper and the thumb in their mouth. <laughs> yeah. Smiling. Yeah. Uh, and I've had parents come in and say, <laughs> my, my son is still touching himself too much. Uh, What's too much? In their perception. And, and so we talk about, you know, uh, the main thing I tell them is don't worry about it. It self-corrects. I mean, I've, I've dealt with a lot of adolescents through the years. I've never seen as a client a high school senior who <laughs> is sent to me because he still is constantly self-massaging uh, at school, on the bus, whatever. In, a, in an yeah. inappropriate in venue. In an inappropriate venue and way. So, you know, they grow out of it. but And, and they learn culturally how to be appropriate, which is what parents are supposed to teach. You, you teach them that about picking their nose. You know, mm -hmm. you teach them to blow their nose, you teach them the appropriate way to dispose of it. I mean, I still have had, when I was teaching high school years and years ago, <laughs> high school boys who didn't have a clue what a handkerchief was. You know, they come up with a handful of mm. sneeze okay, and say, well, can I we get can a talk Kleenex? about vibrators, but I don't do very well. You don't do with it. It's not. <laughs> but they have to learn. And so your job as a parent is to teach them the appropriate methodology. And I would really encourage you not to use shame-based messages right. for any of this stuff, whether it's personal hygiene or whether it's sexual needs and satisfaction. Sex shouldn't be approached from a conversational viewpoint of shame. So can, That can last a lifetime, and that can damage relationships in the future. Right. You don't want your child to have abnormal views right. of sex when they're, when they're children because it carries on. Exactly. And it doesn't just end when they become adults. That my, my, last, my last story will be... My daughter will kill me. When she was when she was little, she went to uh, a Catholic. Uh, I'm not Catholic, but she went to a Catholic uh, nursery school and or uh, preschool. And she told the nuns that you know women had 
girls had uteruses and boys didn't. Mm -hmm. And so that was the difference between a boy and a girl because, of course, being a gynecologist, I didn't want her to have penis envy. <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted her to have something special when she figured out that, you know, in school that that guys had something she didn't have. So, you know, so she felt very special and the nun thought that uh, she should be um, disciplined <laughs> for that. For saying that. For saying that. Yeah. And, and that was, I mean, I was not happy with the nuns and I told Rachel it was all fine, you know, but she didn't even know what she was saying. Well, no. <laughs> she was, she was just being, you know, entertaining as she always has been. With, with so, the knowledge that yeah. she has, which is another lesson you have to teach your children. Just cause you don't know, just cause you know, it doesn't give you the right to educate your friends yeah. you know, let their parents educate <laughs> yeah. them. That's true. So that's true. At any rate, <laughs> what, what we hope to have accomplished is to open your eyes and ears to a consideration or a discussion of something that can be a psychological, physiological, sexual, sensual need. And one of the many ways to consider resolving that need that are not shame based, that are not forbidden, that are not hidden. Uh, and we would encourage you to go on the internet and look there, there, you can find websites, just do a Google search for these devices and look at what they cost, how they're made, how they're used, uh, and see if it's something that would be helpful to you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.